Good morning. Nothing like the red hot chili peppers to start your day, right? So we are just waiting for a few more participants to join. Uh, thank you so much for dialing in today. Um, a warm welcome to the KI Park Tech Talk, AI for Sustainability today. Uh, my name is Sebastian. I'm from Salonis, who is hosting this event. And I'm super excited to host four amazing speakers this morning for you uh, that will cover innovations in the AI space that have an effect on sustainability. We have a very, very interesting lineup for you for sure. And we will get this started in just a minute. And while we do, maybe I can take you quickly through uh, the agenda that we have planned for today. So in the beginning, it's a short welcome from my end and a little bit of a housekeeping that we will cover in just one slide. Afterwards, we have Lars from Salonis covering how to be more efficient in your processes with the help of process mining, which is what Salonis is all about. Next, we have Leon from Precise, super interesting. They have, they're using computer vision to prevent unnecessary returns in e-commerce. It's really exciting. It's one of those ideas that just click and you think this is, uh, this is right. Why has this not been done earlier? So very much looking forward to his talk. Next up, we have Marcus uh, from Delicious Data, a topic close, I think, to everyone's heart, avoiding food waste uh, by using smart and predictive analytics. And last but not least, we have Patrick from Silvera, and that are doing carbon offsetting project ratings. So, you know, when, when typically, um, for example, for every business travel that your company is doing, you're offsetting carbon emissions, for example, by planting trees. And Silvera is, um, is independently and very fairly rating those carbon offsetting projects if they really have an effect or not. After those four talks, we will join together in a little bit of a panel discussion, and this will also be the forum uh, to answer any questions from the audience. Then in terms of housekeeping, you will, might have noticed you are muted and your video is turned off. This is a webinar, so it's us presenting for you. However, we want you to be lively, right? This should be interactive. Um, we want you to encourage to use the chat, so free, free, and um, make sure to also switch the audience, right? There's a little two and there's a drop down to make the audience to everyone, not just the panelists and hosts, but that you can chat to everyone. So, for example, feel free to share where you're dialing in from or share the weather. Uh, it's actually quite cold today in Munich, uh, where, where I'm based. It started to snow, but excited to, to hear what the weather is and where you're dialing in from today. If you have a particular question that you want to have answered in the panel discussion, for example, uh, to any of the, of the startups presenting uh, on the technology, on sustainability, on the innovation, feel free to use the Q&A feature, right? So you can either post in the chat, but it's a little bit easier to track questions if you use the Q&A feature uh, that is presented in Zoom. So we will answer, we will try to answer all of those in the panel discussion. Also, last not least, feel free to follow up with all of our panelists, right? So um, if you find an, a particular technology interesting, if you find a company interesting, uh, you can see the email addresses here. So feel free to start a one-to-one -one conversation or also add people on LinkedIn and start a chat. Everyone is super eager, super open uh, to continue the conversation in more depth, uh, provide you a, um, a demo for yourself, et cetera, et cetera. So that's it, basically. Um, do enjoy, have fun, and be inspired by the great lineup of speakers that we have here for you. And with that, without further ado, I would hand it over to Lars, our first speaker. And uh, let me quickly introduce also Lars. Welcome. Um, Lars is obviously a colleague of mine and is truly a pioneer and expert when it comes to process mining. Lars used to be working for Siemens, which is the first, what was one of the first customers of Salonis. So he was uh, sort of on customer side as early, what was it last, 2014? 2014, yes. Fantastic. So with us really from the start, with the beginning, um, partnering with a startup very mm -hmm. early on from, from a customer's point of view. Now also an author of Process Mining in Action, a book about process mining, 
in action. <laughs> uh, so it's great to have you here today, Lars, to listen and learn a little bit about how process mining can help make processes more efficient. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Really excited to be here. And thank you for inviting me and not my virtual avatar to talk about uh, artificial intelligence. Um, let me share my screen here and uh, start um, building my case on, on three pillars. First, process mining, which is at the core of Silonis and uh, provides a tremendous foundation for sustainability and for artificial intelligence. Second, I talk about sustainability, obviously a topic uh, which is crucial to, to mankind. And then last but not least, artificial intelligence, which provides a huge range of different opportunities and uh, which I believe has an has a amazing perspective and, and future. So starting um, with uh, this image here and uh, just guess what it is. Is it art? Is it, um, is it maybe um, a, a piece of, of digital art like an NFT, non-fungible token? Or is it something new from Banksy, which will be shredded in a minute? No, it's, it's actually a digital twin of a real life process. So this is what you're seeing here as a whole complexity, a digital twin, twin of the order to cash process of my previous uh, employer. When we look 2018 into the process from order entry till cash collection, where we looked into more than 30 million items ordered per year, processed across more than 60 different process steps with more than 300 million single activities and more than 900 process, 900,000 process variants. And this is just an example of the complexity which you'll find every day in every company, in procurement processes, supply chain processes, sales processes. And the power of process mining is to provide this holistic transparency to show the full complexity and then to enable sustainability to see where are the sweet spots, the levers to improve sustainability. To, you know, back 2018, we started with human intelligence to work on this process here to see where the bottlenecks and uh, uh, reasons for late deliveries and, and, and uh, complexity drivers. Today, we expect artificial intelligence to support on um, that kind of uh, uh, digital twin and, uh, and drive improvements. So let me take uh, sustainability into the equation here. And sustainability, if you look into a value chain of an organization from supplier sustainable rating, uh, sourcing of shipments or sourcing shipment emissions, intercompany emissions, there's a whole range of different sweet spots where sustainability plays a crucial role, where sustainability must be taken into the consideration, where sustainability must be considered and needs to become a crucial part of every single process decision. And the amazing part about process mining that it is allows to operationalize um, the single process decisions, that it allows to operationalize carbon emission decisions or how to prevent waste by showing the people in, a daily, in the daily process where are the triggers to uh, reduce emission, to prevent waste with single decisions. And this is actually the full power, the beauty of, of uh, process mining. Now let's take a third part, um, artificial intelligence in the equation here with a couple of uh, challenges, which I want to talk about. First challenge um, any organization has is how to rate suppliers, you know, how to rate suppliers based on sustainability aspects and increase sustainable spend. Second challenge is uh, how to avoid scrap and quality issues. So how to reduce waste, which is a huge field for artificial intelligence to support. And third sample, which I'll talk about, is the outbound shipment. So how to reduce carbon footprint when shipping your goods to your customers and uh, making this in a more conscious manner. And let me dive into three operational examples here of customers of Salonis and how they've tackled this. On the procurement side, looking into the uh, increase of sustainable spend, um, one of our customers, which is a leading online fashion platform here in Germany, had the challenge of uh, manually and unstandardized supplier ratings. So looking into all those suppliers and how to assess and evaluate these suppliers. And where we as Salonis um, are helping this customer is in automatically generating and tracking supplier performance and assessing these suppliers based on sustainability criteria. And then giving that kind of information 
to the people from procurement in a proactive manner that they can make a conscious decision, not only on price, but only also on um, sustainability uh, criteria. And with that, um, they've been able to um, in significantly increase uh, sustainability on their procurement decisions. Second sample for production inventory, um, how to reduce waste. And here, one of our customers as the largest US telecom company um, has been looking into uh, information about uh, scrap and uh, quality issues in their production process, how to get that information in time to make uh, conscious decisions. And uh, where we as Salonis have supported with artificial intelligence and smart algorithms, which um, provide automated alerts to the users where based on this artificial intelligence and a learning system, our technology um, uh, alerts the users about uh, scrap and quality issues in a proactive manner, real-time manner, and then enables the users to interfere immediately and, uh, and systematically avoid scrap and, and quality issues here. And as you can see in certain parts, we've been able to help our customer to reduce waste by 75%. And third sample on the shipment side here for a uh, global consumer product goods company um, where um, here an obvious challenge is how to optimize the shipments to customers and uh, how to get all the relevant information from different data sources about expect delivery times, shipment promise times, announce times, you know, where we supported this customer in uh, bundling shipments, in avoiding air freight, in having on-time deliveries, and uh, thus uh, reduce 20% of outbound shipping emissions by applying artificial intelligence, assessing with smart algorithms which shipments can be bundled, could uh, be shipped with which model split uh, mean or lever, and thus really improving the, um, the shipment. So um, one last example here, ABB, um, which uh, we, we've been working with for quite a, a long time. And as you can see on bottom, sub bottom line here, our colleague, uh, the colleague Heyman Janssen with a statement um, that ABB has those ambitious sustainable targets where we are helping. We looked into 139,000 shipments um, and quantified their emissions, um, uh, which uh, totaled to 16 million kilograms of carbon emission. And uh, the potential which we identified is, uh, is more than 8% in carbon emission reduction. And, and I think this is so exciting. If you look into these um, combination of, of pure, of, of perfect insight based on digital twin, then driving action with artificial intelligence, supporting the users with artificial intelligence to make smarter and more sustainable decisions and thus improve the process execution. I think this is a vast field where we're just at the beginning. And uh, I look forward to the continuous journey. So with that, back to you, Sebastian. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lars. Then I next up is Leon. Let me just finish with one sentence. I continue to be amazed how broadly process mining can be applied. I think this is one, one of the benefits of the technology. It's not just one use case. It's really something that can be used for so many things. So we're di still discovering, I think, uh, 10 years after our, our found, um, after we've been founded, we are still discovering new use cases. Switching gears a little over to precise, I think we are we're really zooming in into one particular use case. I have to say I'm super excited for this particular talk. So good to have you, Leon. Welcome. Um, I think it's an amazing use case, and I really want to learn more today. So it's good to have you. You are the founder and CEO of Precise. So it's an honor also to have you here based in Munich. What more can I say? Welcome and please take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, we are Precise and we develop a sizing solution for fashion e-commerce. Um, we are based here in Munich, started the company in 2019 together with Tommy and Aves. Um, since then, we grew quite a lot. So this slide says 30 people. It's a few weeks old, and now we have 40 people actually. And um, most of most of us have a technical background, so we try to get in uh, fashion know-how as as early as we could, and are supported by by people who have quite some experience in the fashion industry. And we are working hard on solving a problem that all of you know. It's this problem. So. This is you standing in line at the DHL post office with 
a box which contains a piece of clothing that you ordered online that did not fit. So that's a problem that is very common. All of us know it. It's annoying. You have to leave office early and then you stand in line in this large queue with many other people. Um, it is the biggest problem in the fashion e-commerce industry, returns. What we see in Germany is return rates of 50%. Um, in many cases, even higher, 60, 70% is, is common. Um, and around half of those returns are actually caused by the wrong size or poor fit. And if you, you know, make an analogy to other industries, it's just completely crazy. Like imagine you open up a bakery and then every second piece of bread that you're selling over the counter comes right back to you. You would seriously reconsider your business model, but in the fashion industry, this is like the status quo. Another part of the problem, which many people don't know, is that you also have conversion rates, which are quite low, around 2%, meaning 98% of the consumers on a fashion e-commerce shop are not buying anything. And we know that one of the main reasons is the size uncertainty. So if you have many brands, no one knows if Nike is smaller or larger than Adidas, for example. And removing that uncertainty increases conversion rate quite a bit. On top of all of it, you have this overarching sustainability aspect. Every return causes 500 grams CO2 emission. The products sometimes cannot be resold. They have to be washed. They have to be ironed. Um, it's, it's just completely inefficient. And that's why we're working on this problem. And here you can see the solution that we've built. So Precise is integrated as an add-on, as a white label um, within online shops. And here you can see uh, one of our customers, Keller Sports, they sell all kinds of sports brands. And there's this button with what size fits me. If you click on it and um, our solution opens as a white label, you can see same colors, same fonts. We ask you a few basic questions, like for example, what is your weight or what is your age? And then you tell us what your fit preference is, tight, regular, loose, and so on. And afterwards you can, if you want to record a video of your body. You can also skip that step if you don't wanna do it and just answer questions. But if you decide to go for the video as a user, this is what happens. You place your phone on the ground, take a few steps back, and just turn around. Um, this is quite robust, so you don't have to undress, you don't have to get naked, just normal jeans and t-shirt is completely fine. And then we create a 3D model of your body, predict your body measurements, match these body measurements to sizing data and transactional data of other users, and then we show you the size we recommend. So in that case, it's size small. And if you click on other brands, you might have a different size. And if you switch to another shop that is also working with pre-size, um, you will also get our size recommendations. We have almost 300 brands on board already. And this has a huge business impact. So we are always A-B testing our solution and we see up to 15% increase in conversion rate simply because we removed this size uncertainty. Um, average order values also get higher and we can reduce the return rate for pre-size users by up to 25%, which saves a lot of CO2. We are doing this with quite a lot of brands already. Um, we have done everything from like uh, Kruger Dirndl, for example, is the market leader in, in Trachten. So Oktoberfest wear like Dirndl and Lederhosen. We've done sustainable fashion with Waschbär. We have done sports brands. Uh, we have done shapewear, we have done wetsuits, we have done formal clothing, um, we have done fast fashion with Veromoda. And um, so it works in all categories. And um, what is happening in the background is this. So as a user, you can either do the video scan or if you don't want to do it because you're, for example, in the train or at work, maybe where you don't want to turn in front of your smartphone, you just answer a few body questions instead. We predict body measurements with this. Um, we have the biggest um, data set um, in, in the industry for at least the use case that, that, we, um, that we have at hand here and yeah, predict these body measurements um, with a very high accuracy. And then we match these measurements to product data and to size tables. Then we give you a size recommendation, the user's order, and then we feed back if people keep the order or not. So, and we have a closed feedback loop and our algorithm learns from other users with similar bodies.
based on if they kept a certain product from a certain brand in a certain size or not. And we have the vision to bring the perfect fit to 1 billion garments by 2023. So we have two years left. And if you want to join us on that mission in any capacity and want to work together, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, this is my email, leon at precise.ai. And yeah, thanks a lot for your attention. And let's make the world and online shopping a bit more sustainable. Fantastic. Thank you, Leon. I I just have to say, I love the whole thing. It, it sounds almost a bit like science fiction, um, but it, it is working, right? You do have customers that are applying it every day. So this is fantastic. Love to get more, more insights later in the panel discussion. On, on to our next speaker, on to Markus, who will present um, also a topic I think that is very close to heart. We all know it, and I hope you allow me to quickly introduce it, Markus. And um, we, we know the, the, the problem of food waste, like for example, your local bakery, and there are a lot of initiatives. I know many of my friends, for example, they organize like that, that they distribute leftovers that are being distributed um, among the friends and family and maybe sometimes also poor people, but it, it really breaks everyone's heart, right? Seeing all this bread and uh, delicious food going to waste. So what if you could actually prevent in the first place that this waste is being produced? And this is exactly the problem that Marcus and Delicious Data are tackling. Over to you. Uh, thanks a lot, Sebastian. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. And thank, thanks for the invite. And also thanks for the nice uh, intro, because uh, that's exactly what we are about. We do love all initiatives uh, that tackle uh, food waste along, along the chain. And uh, what we are trying to do is prevent the, the food waste uh, with a special focus on the out of home uh, industry. Uh, who we are, maybe <laughs> to, uh, to one step uh, back, uh, Delicious State, uh, we are a startup company founded roughly four years ago, also based in Munich, and uh, we are a SaaS company with an AI platform for a sustainable food sector. And uh, to start with, I uh, want to give a short spotlight on the problem, on the global problem itself. Uh, roughly one third of the world's food has never been eaten. So it's being thrown away. And that waste uh, is responsible for about 8% of the global CO2 emissions and uh, estimates uh, yearly about 2.6 trillion US dollars in financial costs along the way. And uh, what we do see this problem in the out of home market or in general has one main driver. And the main driver is the uncertainty in the customer demand. That's for businesses in the food sector, the same as uh, you, uh, you see at home. You do not know exactly when you will be using what, and therefore along the chain, wherever food gets touched, food gets sold, food gets eaten, there will be food waste. And uh, what we see as well is the highest losses occur in those uh, industries or in those food items with a short shelf life. Um, and uh, within those four verticals, which we are mainly uh, serving to, um, it's the same problem. And uh, one short fact on the, on the right hand side, you see from the retail um, industry, um, the biggest impact, uh, the biggest losses relative to the revenue is on baked goods and not as you maybe think uh, uh, in the first second on, on meat and, and fish and things like that because um, there is the shortest shelf life uh, occurring. And uh, how we tackle uh, this problem is with our AI platform, we are optimizing the planning processes and also monitor the savings for the food businesses. So the first part in this three-step process, so to say, to simplify it, is the demand forecast. So we predict on an item level, the demand forecast up to several weeks ahead which uh, is then for the buying process or for the production process relevant, then we do optimize the production. A lot of the food we are consuming, uh, we, are, we are buying, uh, is then in the final step within the last 24 hours handled and being processed. So that is something also a very US, uh, definitely a USP for us that we are very strongly focusing on the last mile of the food processing because there we also see the most waste happening. 
And then we do with our food waste monitoring, measure the impact, see the results, give it back again to our demand forecast so we can learn and get better and save more food along the way. Um, how the prediction, uh, the deep learning algorithm is, is working is uh, quite simple. Besides uh, the, the tech behind, we do get the existing data from POS, from ERP systems. We see what happened in the, in the history, what happened, uh, what, and uh, we uh, put uh, additional data, like external data, weather data, holidays, it's classic factors, but also all other information, all other data points we can collect. We put that and throw that into our deep learning algorithm and therefore predict on an hourly uh, base uh, the forecast for each sales item. And here um, you see a very, very uh, easy um, UI interface, uh, which is then located uh, in the operations part, which the people are using on the last mile. So that's classic to-do list, where we then predict on an hourly, two hourly based, what items will be sold in the near future set, what has to be produced in this moment. So it's gonna be ready when the customer wants it, but on a level that we reduce the food waste and increase the freshness on the highest possible level. Um, our solution, we, we heard a couple of uh, very, uh, very interesting and, and good numbers before. What we can achieve and average with our customers is 40% uh, uh, improving on the planning accuracy, uh, one third uh, reducing of the food waste and roughly 4% less cost of goods sold. Um, those numbers within those industries are very impressive, although maybe they don't sound uh, so impressive depending on what you compare it with. And uh, this is really a game changer along uh, the, the value chain. And that's also very important for us. Our mission is to reduce the food waste and to increase sustainability, but that's combined with a solid business case behind for all of our customers. Uh, one other aspect uh, we, we, are, we are tackling is to monitor the food waste and actually visualize what's happening on a kind of low tech, uh, solution so the operations can actually handle with it. So we literally measure the food waste on different measurement points. We put it into our system. We see the results and we, the system can learn from it and further improve um, what the impact is. And also one thing, as I mentioned before, um, it's very important for us to reduce the food waste and it's very important for our customers. So we also, what uh, we are saving on meals, on kilograms and tons, on CO2, on drinking water, uh, which is a huge factor when producing uh, food uh, along the chain. Uh, we can also see the impact is happening and what also our customers and we like to do, also do good and talk about it, really show what happened, what increased, uh, what impact uh, you could achieve together uh, with us along the chain. And, uh, one uh, last uh, thing, uh, our references, a couple of customers, why I put it there, not only because we are proud of them uh, from different sectors, you see business caterers, you see bakeries, but also companies, um, wherever food gets touched, gets sold to their customers, to their clients, to their employees, there is food waste happening and there we can support to reduce the food waste. So if anybody's interested to, to continue to talk or also maybe to implement uh, those uh, solutions within their companies, I'm more than happy to continue the chat. Here's my contact details, reach out to me and to us anytime. And uh, with that, I'd say uh, thanks uh, and uh, back to you, Sebastian. Thank you so much, Marcus, super interesting. I, I love how this is bringing um, AI and analytics to a sector that is maybe not the most uh, digital native, if you think about your, your bakery around the corner, right? And I also really like that this is going beyond pure statistics, right? This is by including weather information, holiday information, and having much more metadata on the type of food. Um, I think it, it's much more precise uh, than any just uh, statistics. So super interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going, we're zooming out again from, from very local uh, bakery around your corner. 
to a more corporate topic once again, which is uh, are the carbon offsetting projects. For that end, I welcome Patrick from Silvera on stage. Uh, and in my understanding, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, so carbon offsetting projects are done by typically, for example, corporates. For example, if Salonis uh, wants to offset our carbon emissions that our employees do on business travel, for example, by taking the plane, we could invest into carbon offsetting projects like, uh, for example, planting trees in, in the Amazon rainforest, let's say, a bit, uh, <laughs> a bit simplified. And what Severa offers is actually a fair and independent AI-based assessment if this carbon offsetting project is actually worth uh, its money and is actually doing what it says on the tin. At least this is my understanding, and I'm now very happy to learn more from Patrick. Thanks so much, Sebastian. Great to join you all today. And um, yeah, Sebastian, you've definitely got the spirit of a lot of what we do. Um, so let's dive in a little bit more. Um, so we talk about bringing clarity to the carbon markets. And if any of the people on this call have been engaged in the voluntary carbon market, you'll know how difficult it is to actually understand what's happening on the ground of these projects. And so what we do is, um, well, we, we, we look at a couple of points. We look, first of all, at the, the reality that nature is the most effective means that we have to sequester carbon at scale in the coming decades. And we look at this explosion of demand for carbon offsets as a result of corporate net zero and carbon neutral commitments and the creation of carbon neutral products those with the climate partner badge in Germany being particularly uh, common. Um, but the marketplace for these assets of bought and sold is highly dysfunctional. It's one where there's very little uh, understanding of what of the quality of the assets, very little relationship between price and quality, lots of middlemen extracting value for themselves. And as a result of this, there is a real, real uh, discomfort among large corporates to engage in the market. Um, and that leads to very negative climate outcomes. And so what we're here to do is bring that independent view uh, to these projects so that organizations like you can buy with confidence and can report to your stakeholders and can make sure that Greenpeace or Foodwatch don't end up at your door, knocking it down, saying you're another greenwasher. So um, that's, what, that's what we're up to. And, you know, look, there's some good things. The world is changing, or, you know, this, this, discussion today is evidence of the appetite and the commitment of large organizations um, to a more sustainable future. And the other reality is that the carbon offsets are exploding. You know, the conservative expectation is this is a 40 times growth market over the coming years. More realistic is probably around 100 times. And that's before even the price increases that uh, have occurred over the last six months where the assets have gone from trading at about $4 a ton to now at about $14 in that short period. Um, as I said, this market is, is problematic. It's, it's highly complex. If anybody here has ever looked at the documentation that underpins these projects, there are multiple 300 page documents that are almost impossible to get through. They're not done in a standardized format and often the, the information within them is inconsistent or conflicting or key bits are missing. Um, and it's also very difficult to understand what's actually happening on the ground. So for instance, the uh, in a typical project, you would be lucky to get um, an update of whether the forest is there or whether it's been chopped down every three to five years. That's not good enough for large corporates who are making quarterly reports, for instance. And so as a result, this creates a huge amount of risk for big corporates. Um, so, you know, what, how do these risks manifest? Well, they, as they manifest first as reputational risk. Um, so we see large members of, uh, of the press looking to take down these projects. And we think they do that in a really unconstructive way where, you know, these, not only are these forests beneficial from a carbon perspective, they're also beneficial from a community perspective and from a biodiversity perspective. And so, discouraging people from protecting them really can be counterproductive. Um, we're also seeing share price impact here. And this is really interesting because, you know, in, in past waves of sustainability, there has been, um, I mean, a failure on a failure to engage the institutional capital uh, communities, whereas now 
sustainability is no longer a little reedy limb of the marketing department. This is instead now core CFO and CEO strategy, where you have $130 trillion of assets under management committed to net zero. If a, if a corporate cannot articulate what they're doing on a net zero basis, if they cannot report on that robustly, and if they cannot maintain their, a good reputation when they do so, they risk increasing their cost of capital. Um, and then, and simply, you know, a big German automotive client of ours was about to buy $10 million from one project, which I'll show you in a moment. And it, the trees just aren't there. They've been cut down. So that was $10 million that would have been thrown out the window. Um, so what do we do? Well, we, um, we help organizations pick the best offsets. Um, to, we help you protect your reputation, save money and save time. And I'll show you now through the platform what we do to enable that. Um, the platform that we built is, is really very cutting edge. Like we are, we are a, we've lent very deeply into geospatial machine learning technology in order to be able to assess enormous amounts of satellite data from multiple different sources. We're working with NASA to, uh, to build up new training data, which will inform a camera that sits up in the International Space Station, which sounds like science fiction and is incredibly cool. And it allows us to, um, it allows us to calibrate that camera much more accurately. So rather than having individuals with a measuring tape measuring the circumference of a tree um, in a few sample plots in, across thousands of hectares, instead we can take a whole of project view with, with um, a granularity of three millimeters. So taking 5,000 data points per meter squared. So you know we're just transforming the accuracy in this market. And let me show you then what it looks like. So, this is the platform that we make available to our customers. And you can see there's a whole bunch of projects rated from AAA to D. Um, and let's take a look at, so it's a little bit more fun um, or worrying, depending how you think about it, to take a look at a project that hasn't performed so well. So um, the, what I'll show you now is the satellite data that we, that we visualize to our clients. Um, so this project here is in Cambodia, central Cambodia. Um, and what I'll do in a moment is flick on this forest change filter. And the forest change filter allows us to see whether the trees are there or whether they've disappeared. And so you can see in this instance that a very large amount of this forest has disappeared since inception. In fact, nearly 30% of it has. And so this project has done so poorly that by our, in our scoring metric, we give it a 0% score on, on this carbon score, which is derived from our geospatial and machine learning expertise and does quite poorly across other metrics as well. Um, so that's a, a very rapid example of, of the analysis that we present. There are, however, loads of really good projects out there. And this is what is really critical, is to make sure that organizations are not relying on um, data that comes from brokers who are conflicted, you know, who are not, are not inclined to share um, the most independent data about these projects. But this one, you can see very little red within this project area here. So this is a really good one. Um, it's achieving its goals and it's achieving those goals, notwithstanding a lot of pressure in the local area. For instance, here is a logging company just around the corner from this project. So look, that's, that's the platform that we make available to our customers. Uh, it's built up from you know, hundreds of tests, like the, the scores that we get to rely on hundreds of tests. Um, we, we have an expert team, you know, like we mentioned from, from NASA, we're working with multiple academics, and then our team itself have uh, a raft of PhDs. And we're working with giant organizations across the world. So the world's biggest buyer of offsets, which is a US airline, um, like I mentioned, German automotive, Euro European oil and gas major, um, Salesforce, uh, you know, the, the top three consultancies in the world, um, you know, many financial intermediaries as well, and banks who are all looking to provide services to their clients or who are looking to put money to work um, to, to gain, from the, gain from a speculative basis within this market as well. Um, we provide loads of great service, of course, and we expose you to uh, not only our, our technical team, but also our product team and our policy team. You know, this market is rapidly moving towards a regulated status. So pretty key to understand all those um, risks. Um, and yes, we, we're, we're an international team headquartered in London, 
I'm based in Dublin. We have members in the Himalayas to New York at the moment, so spread all over and um, having a lot of fun, doing a lot of really good work. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, Sebastian, it's great to be part of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Also super exciting. And with that, I would suggest that we start the panel discussion. So we did get a chance to answer a few questions already in the Q&A functionality. That's terrific. Um, and maybe we can we can just continue the conversation here to some extent. Um, I think Marcus is also just typing. Uh, feel free to, to join the conversation. So one topic I wanted to dig into a little bit is the tension that I feel is between sustainability and profit making. So to me, sort of in the classical world, it feels like companies are conflicted. You know, I want to do good, but you know, I, I have an obligation to my shareholders. I want to be profitable. And it seems that there is this conflict that companies need to decide either to do good or to be to make money. So maybe let's start with Leon. Uh, how do you feel about this? Yeah. Uh, so for, I think it's very dependent on the industry. We have the lucky case where reducing returns is, you know, makes you more profitable and is good for the environment. So we don't have this conflict here, but I think that's very rare. Um, and having this alignment was also one of the reasons why we started the company, because um, it's not that easy to find something that is that makes so much sense economically and um, from a sustainability perspective. I think there are other cases like this, but but we are quite lucky in that sense um, because, yeah, you know that return, it's unnecessary for the planet, it's unnecessary for the customer, it's unnecessary for the shop, so interests are very aligned here. In that sense, you're, you're almost a bit lucky, right? Because it, it makes so perfect sense. Marcus, how is it about you? What's the primary motivation for your customers? Is it primarily to reduce uh, money waste or to reduce food waste? Um, it depends, uh, of course, a bit on the industry and the company itself. And uh, very often there's also different stakeholders. So it depends on what is our first touch point. Is it uh, within the sustainability department, which which all bigger companies uh, have an, an increase on, on stuff and also importance? They're definitely, that is the focus. But what I truly believe is there's the impact is valuable and is necessary, but without a strong business case behind, we'd be sitting here with two customers uh, or maybe three. Um, so the combination is what, what actually then makes it through the different stakeholders that it's working. We reduce the food waste, uh, we have a good uh, CO2 impact, but also they just reduce money on on the whole line. I mean, the buying less food is of course, but then also waste gives gives more um, more touch points for uh, for additional additional costs. So the combination is, I believe, for most companies, then what actually gets to to work with us. Yeah, and maybe that's the hope, right? That there, it doesn't have to be a conflict. That but the two are actually married. And you, you can do good while being profitable, or maybe you are profitable because you do good uh, going forward. Definitely. Lars, you've been in the industry also for, for some while now. How do you perceive the change of the topic sustainability? Is it something that is coming more and more, or is it, has it always been around? What, do you, what would you assess? Well, my assessment is that it's too slow. You know, since matter of fact, I think the industry is still driven by value by saving by efficiency this is where the majority of decision makers in a company are triggered by show me the money show me the business case show me the value and and, and if you want to quantify sustainability it's not an easy call you know i mean precise has a good a perfect uh, business model for that if you look at the other companies like like siemens you know how do you quantify that you know and i think this is where i think we have to be more creative and also government needs to step in stronger in saying carbon emission is not a free good it needs to be priced it needs to be paid for you know whatever you put out there is carbon emission or waste this is something which needs to be taken into the equation and then also operationalize that people who decide which supplier to take or which which shipment motors to take they have that kind of carbon emission in the equation, not only euros and dollars. So, so that, that's a way to go. I think we're on a good track since uh, obviously with the consciousness about sustainability and the power of AI, there's lots of ideas, but it's still a way to go. Yeah, I would, I would agree. 
Uh, I think they, I, I personally I see an, an uprise of the trend, but it's it's not not enough just yet. Uh, Patrick, how is it? How do you perceive the topic? So is the the need for those offsetting projects? I mean, have there been more projects in the recent years than before? Um, there is certainly a there's certainly a large number that are coming down the pipe, and the the demand for offsets is exploding. So uh, that has that's what's driven this enormous increase in price and. Uh, it's also what's driving corporates upstream. So they're looking to become project developers rather than just buyers of the offsets themselves. Um, they're the, the reality of them being able to achieve that, I think, is, uh, is still unproven. Um, you know, it is, it is a risky set of activities to undertake. Um, and there may be better, uh, there may be, you know, intermediaries and financial players and investors who are better placed to, um, to deploy capital to achieve that. Um, that said, you know, organizations like oil and gas companies have, you know, are, are well used to deploying billions of dollars of capital over multi-decade time horizons sim in, in projects that are similar to this. Um, so, yeah, there are some corporates that are better placed than others. But, but like back, back to the point on sustainability versus corporate success, you know, what we are seeing very clearly is a recognition from these large organizations um, that sustainability has to be part of their core operating procedure. And that if it isn't, they're concerned that that will lead to a cost of capital implication. So whether that's on the debt side or on the equity piece. Um, and you know, IFRS is coming to this market as well. It will, there will be increased disclosures required from corporates. Um, and so they will, you know, they will need to report in a consistent manner. They will need to do so in a robust way that is free from criticism. And that is capable of analysis by all of the financial players out there. Um, and if they fail to do so, they'll they'll pay for that. Um, a good example um, recently uh, in Australia, uh, one of the big miners is trying to sell off a coal mining bit of its business, um, and it essentially sold it for zero. Um, you know, the discounted cash flow on a project like that is now equivalent to zero, given the uh, given the costs associated. The environmental costs associated with that and the mitigants that are required um, and i would argue so yeah, I, I think i think it's highly aligned now rather than a conflict yeah and i would argue there's not not only legal and reporting and sort of regulatory pressure i think there's there will be increasingly more pressure from consumers in terms of brand building in terms of how you're perceived i think at some point consumers will just not buy from from companies with a bad reputation anymore it will become more and more important so absolutely right there is one question in the chat for you, Patrick, um, around the, the um, purchase of certificates. So, right, you can either invest in those offsetting projects or you can actually buy this uh, CO2 um, emission certificates. So how would, you, how would you consider those and weigh those against each other? Yeah, so it's a, look, at, like I mentioned, it's a dysfunctional market and, and it lacks liquidity. So the, the ways in which you can buy, you can buy directly from a project developer um, or you can buy uh, on the spot market and you can buy from the developer on the spot market or you can buy from, from another person who's holding those credits. Um, you can also put in place long-term offtake agreements, so a long-term commitment to purchase credits from a developer. Um, those, are, uh, those are easier ways than developing your own project, uh, without question. Um, so, you know, I, I, while there is this strong appetite among corporates to build up their own proprietary supply so they can avoid the price risks that they're seeing right now. Um, as I mentioned, the, the achievability of that is, is reasonably low. Um, so what we see is uh, a number of intermediaries, people like Macquarie, Hartree, Goldman Sachs, uh, Vital, Glencore, Trafigura, all flooding money into this market to develop projects. Um, and so we see, we expect um, corporates to build up long-term relationships with those intermediaries to support their purchases um, uh, in different ways. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Perfect. Yeah, thank you so much. So maybe last one on sustainability in general goes to, to Leon also from, from the audience around change being actually a two-sided street. So how can we actually help for example, in the fashion industry to make it easier for consumers to do the right thing? It's a big question. Mm -hmm. So I assume uh, with customers, 
the end consumer is meant here. Actually, I think the to me it feels like the end consumers are further down the sustainability road than than some of the 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 brands. Um, because what we see in our AB tests, so we are very data driven and try to find out when you know more people use our solution in the shops and when they give us a higher net promoter scores, when they're happier with our solution and so on. And it's very interesting because um, we try we test different arguments why you should use precise. We say it's you know anonymous, we delete the video, it's fast, it's accurate, it's convenient. And we also say um, it's sustainable, right? It's more sustainable because the likelihood that you order something that, that you don't have to return is higher. And we see that uh, in the IB test that end consumers are actually more likely to use us if we nudge them towards this whole sustainability topic. So um, this also depends a bit on the age group and so on, but I feel like there's really a generation coming that, that really cares. Um, and um, so I think, I don't know how that is. I mean, one anecdote is like, um, 10 years ago, my whole friend circle was like, you know, we have, we were having big barbecues and everyone was eating meat. And now if you say like you eat meat, it's almost like, you know, you're the outsider. So I feel like there's a, a huge change coming. And I feel like the consumers are actually faster in adopting it than the, than the companies, but companies eventually have to adopt if the consumers demand for more sustainable yeah. offerings, right? And I guess I would say try to create a win-win, right? So if you don't have to wait in line posting your returns, uh, if you don't have to order so much, right? If you're saving money, if th that is one thing, if there's an upside for the consumer. And the other thing is make it simple, right? I don't want to install something. I don't want to, you know, take more time. If I can just scan me once, right? And then all the brands are using this information for my, for my size estimation this is everything that is that is helping that case shifting gears once more a little into a more maybe technical area because there has been also a lot of questions about ai models regression etc and um, marcus can you also tell us a little bit about the magic behind this so can you deep dive a little into the technicalities what kind of regression models are you using um anything you some buzzwords that you can share of course, um, I'm happy to. Um, the, the first, uh, when it comes especially to the business catering side, uh, we use uh, natural language processing uh, to understand the food and um, the, the items behind it. So um, we, we do our algorithm can understand not just from a historical part, what this one item has been sold like 15 times, but understands, is it meat? What kind of meat it is, is it? Uh, what vegetables is with it? Is it from a German cuisine? Is it Asian cuisine? And therefore also put that into, into the algorithm, combine what combination of foods are offered and what is sold in the in the in the past. What is the change of the history uh, and the, and the trends, and therefore predict uh, the future. And then um, for um, predicting the whole volume of items sold of customers coming on the, on the on the business catering side, we we use classical deep learning models, and also when it comes then that we break it down uh, to what different um, sectors meet vegetarian, vegan, uh, we use classical deep learning uh, models uh, to go in, into detail of that and then break it up between how many customers, uh, how many guests are we expecting in three weeks uh, on, on, a, on a first day and then break it down uh, to the different uh, parts. So that in a in a very short uh, nutshell, and when it comes to the to the bakeries, where it's not so much of a of a change uh, always in the in the menu and in, in the offerings, it's also mainly on on deep learning uh, different deep learning models which we combine, but which we also differ uh, within the different industries, and also we see and we had to to change. Um, the, the algorithm a bit uh, over the last one and a half years as the impact and the dynamics with uh, and cause of Corona, of course, changed tremendously uh, before we saw over a couple of weeks that there is changes that there might be changes in the in the food trends in the behavior on single locations. Now we also have to focus very much um, depending uh, is is home office uh, what is the different solutions also what is the impact we sometimes can put in that we know how many people are coming 
into an office building, but still then in some locations, the weather has a much higher impact because when you give uh, employees the opportunity to come or not to come in the morning, how the weather has a much bigger impact as it was in the past. So also there, of course, we had to change and adapt to the, to the current uh, and future situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. There has been also another question, and maybe this goes to Patrick uh, this time, uh, around explainability of those models, which I find interesting. So how much are customers actually accepting this as a black box, as sort of magic that AI is, is outputting? And how much are they questioning, you know, how do you exactly analyze the deforestation? How do you exactly come to your conclusions? Is this something that customers expect? Uh, or is this just something that is readily accepted? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it depends on the buyer, um, would be the high level unhelpful answer. Um, so in particular for say financial traders who are looking to speculate in the market, um, the depth of the work that we do is less meaningful for them. Um, you know, they're looking for price signals and the opportunity to uh, create arbitrage between price and quality. Um, However, for corporates who are going to be hanging their reputation on the information that we're providing, it's much more important. And so the typical sales process for us is, you know, an introductory call where we go through the platform similar to the way that I did with you all today um, with more depth. Um, but then beyond that, we'll typically have a 90 minute deep dive where we're coming through the methodology um, that we apply um, uh, across both the, the AI piece, but also our wider methodolo methodological assessment of these projects. Um, so yeah, it depends on the bar. All right. I, I see that. I see that. We are, we're slowly coming up to the hour. Uh, there is one, one statement that I would like to make actually uh, to the audience, which is once more bringing this example of actually Lars's story or the Siemens story in combination with Salonis. So I think one part of the puzzle is innovators like Precise, Delicious Data, and Severa, um, innovating on technologies and creating a new offer. Another part of the puzzle is the industry accepting this. And here it is companies like Siemens uh, and all those, those big corporates that are actually are bold. And it's in the end, it's, it, it is humans, right? That are bold and then make the, that decision. That are bold in adopting those new technologies and that they partner with those startups and they believe in these products. So I think it takes two to tango and it needs innovators and pioneers also on those large corporates to actually buy into those technologies. So if you're on this call today from coming from a company or a corporate, I would just encourage you to, to take a leap of faith and to invest and put your trust into people uh, like we have on this call today. So this is my, my closing remark. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today. I really enjoyed the session. Special thanks to our to our speakers. And yeah, this is it. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Sebastian. Thanks, Sebastian. Thank